Howdy, Mr. Mark with you again, and today is a very exciting day in your physics career, because today we begin studying rotational dynamics. We're going to start just by studying rotational motion. Up until now, we've only considered things that have been moving back and forth in straight lines. We haven't really discussed things that are rotating. So the first thing we might want to know is what exactly does rotation mean? Something is rotating when it's going around in a circle, and the axis of that circle, or center, is internal to the object. So, for example, if we have a wheel that is spinning, there's a wheel, let's suppose it's spinning counterclockwise like that, since the middle or center or axis of the wheel is inside the wheel itself, we would say that it is rotating. Don't confuse this with revolutions, which we've already studied. In revolution, the axis is external to the object. So for example, the moon revolves around the earth. The earth is not inside the moon, therefore that is a revolution, not a rotation. So how do we describe rotational motion? Consider a point on our wheel. So there's our wheel, and here's a point, let's just call it P. So as the wheel turns, let's just suppose that it's turning counterclockwise again. So like this. Our point P is going to move, and it's going to move some linear distance L. Now, if we had a different point on the wheel, like one closer to the center, like for example point Q, it's going to move a different linear distance when the wheel makes one-eighth of a counterclockwise rotation. So you can see that the distance L between point Q's original position and final position is much smaller than the distance L between point P's original and final position. So what you end up with is that any point on the wheel that you choose, you're going to get a different linear distance travel. If you were to pick a point at the center of the wheel, then you would get a linear distance of zero. And so all that to say, that's very confusing, and it doesn't really help us describe the motion of the wheel as a whole. We can describe specific points on the wheel, but that doesn't help us describe the wheel. So there's got to be a better way. The better way to measure the motion of a wheel or other rotating object is to use what's referred to as the angular displacement. The angular displacement is the angle that a point on a rotating object moves through. And since it's an angle, we're just going to assign it the symbol theta. So here's our wheel again. There's point P. And let's rotate our wheel an eighth of a counterclockwise turn again. So now point P is over there. If we draw a radius R from the center of the wheel to point P, it's going to move with point P like that, it transcribes an angle. We're going to call that angle theta. The cool thing about that angle is it's the same for all points on the wheel. So if we had point Q back in here again, point Q is like right here, then point Q would move through the same angle theta. It would have a smaller r, but the angle would be the same. So that's why the angular displacement is a more useful measurement of the motion of the object rather than the linear displacement. So, let's talk about the radian. The radian is going to be a new unit of angle measurement that we're going to use for angular displacements. Now we could measure angular displacement in degrees or number of rotations, but that's not very convenient. It's much more convenient to use this new unit called the radian. So what is a radian? A radian is the angle that's created when the radius, which was r we drew a second ago, and the arc length, which is the path length l we drew a second ago, are the same. So kind of draw a picture. Here's our angle theta created by the radius between the point moving on the wheel and the center of the wheel. There's the arc length l. And there's our angle theta. So when L is equal to R, then we've moved through an angle of one radian. So you can see that that would be a specific angle. If L was a little bit bigger, 
then that angle would be greater than 1. If the angle was a little bit smaller, then it would be less than 1 radian. So a general equation that we can write is that the angular displacement of an object, or excuse me, point on an object that is rotating, is equal to the linear distance it's moved over its radius when we're using the unit radians. So you can kind of see how radians would be useful because we may want to be able to relate the linear and rotational motion of a point on a rotating object. So real quickly, recognize that the L over R, both of those would be measured in meters. So what a radian is, it's a ratio between meters. So the unit radian is a meter per meter. So really we just write it as a placeholder to remind ourselves that we're using the convention of radians rather than degrees or something else. So let's jot down some useful conversions. You should know from geometry that the distance around an entire circle, so there's our wheel, if we go around one time, is the circumference of the circle. We should know how to find the circumference of a circle. So if we have a circle of radius r, then the angular displacement as we move through one rotation would simply be L over R, and L would be 2 pi R, and so theta would come out to be 2 pi radians. So for one complete rotation, the angular displacement is just 2 pi radians, and that's something I want you to remember. You can remember that, it's just the circumference of a circle divided by its radius. You end up with 2 pi. You probably also know that a circle is 360 degrees, so that gives us another conversion from radians to degrees. So again, using radians allows us to easily go back and forth between the rotational motion of the object and the linear motion of a point on the object. And we'll see situations throughout the next couple of weeks where we need to use both and go back and forth between the two. So here are some pictures I saw from some dude on the internet. Um, if you have a complete circle, you can see both of those are complete circles, then essentially you're going through 2 pi radians. And so pi is a little bit more than 3, so a complete circle, 2 pi, would be a little bit more than 6 radians. So that's kind of frustrating that we can't get an exact conversion, just the nature of circles, but we should be able to recognize that a circle is about 6 radians. So that kind of gives us an idea of how big a radian actually is. It's about 53 degrees, if I remember correctly. Okay. So, if things are moving, obviously we want to know how fast they're going. So we're going to redefine our velocity for angular um, displacement to be the rate at which angular position changes with respect to time. We're going to call that the angular velocity. We're going to give that the symbol omega. It's a lowercase omega, one of those Greek letters. So the angular velocity omega is just the change in the angle over the change in time. And we would measure that in radians per seconds. So compare that to linear velocity, the very first thing we learned this year in physics. That's just the change in linear position over time, which will be measured in meters per second. The other thing we have to remember with uh, velocities is we need a direction. Possible directions for our angular velocity are clockwise and counterclockwise. Those are our only two choices for something that is rotating. So let's look at a quick example. Suppose we have a merry-go-round. It's going to be a pretty big merry-go-round. We've got Anna and Brett standing on it. Anna's one meter away from the center of the merry-go-round, and Brett is two meters away from the center of the merry-go-round. We want to find the angular velocity of both people and the linear velocity of both people. So basically we want to measure how fast they're going two different ways. So let's start with the angular stuff. We know that it takes them 20 seconds to go 10 counterclockwise rotations. So I'm just going to write down that delta theta is 10 rotations. And then because we want this to be in radians, I'm just going to multiply it by the conversion factor. 2 pi radians per 1 rotation. 
the rotations would cancel out, and so in radians, my angular displacement is just 20 pi. So finding the angular velocity, just divide that by the 20 seconds, would give me pi radians per second. Now let's include the direction. They're going counterclockwise. And then realize that because they're on the same rotating object, they have the same angular velocity. They're completing pi radians per second. If you want to write that as about 3.1 radians per second counterclockwise, that's fine too. Either way is okay with me. So if we convert that to linear motion, remember that theta can be found by dividing the L by the R. And rewriting it, L would just be R theta. If we divide both sides by time, which is a neat little trick you might want to remember how to do, the left side of that would give us the velocity. Theta over delta time is just the angular velocity. So basically, we've just taken our relationship between the angle and the linear distance and created a relationship between the angular velocity and the linear velocity. This is always going to be true if our omega is in radians per second. So calculating Anna's linear velocity, just multiply the pi radians per second by her radius, which is 1. So she's moving at pi meters per second. And because her direction is constantly changing, I'm not going to worry about trying to give that a direction. We're just going to worry about the magnitude of it. So for Brett, he's got a radius of 2 meters. So multiply that by pi radians per second. So Brett is moving at a velocity of 2 pi meters per second. So they're both moving at the same angular velocity meaning they complete the same number of rotations in the same time, but Brett's moving at a faster linear velocity. So, if you're kind of thinking about on a merry-go-round, who's going faster, you may think Brett's going faster because the wind's blowing through his hair at a higher speed, or you may consider them to be going the same speed since they're both moving the same number of turns per second. Both ways of thinking about are useful in different ways, which we'll encounter later on. All right, last thing to discuss is angular acceleration. Just like before, we're just going to go from linear acceleration to angular acceleration. We'll just replace the velocity with the angular velocity. The symbol for angular acceleration is the Greek letter alpha, which we're already familiar with. And so alpha would just be the change in omega over the change in time. The unit for angular acceleration would be radians per second per second, which is probably more conveniently written as radians per second squared. Again, compare that to the linear acceleration. Linear acceleration is just the change in velocity over time. Angular acceleration is just the change in angular velocity over time. So there's really nothing new here. We're just redefining it for a rotating object. So let's look at another example. Um, let's suppose we have a computer hard drive, like what would be in your laptop, that has a radius of about 10 centimeters. Totally making that up. When it's switched off, it goes from 7200 RPM, which is how hard drives are typically measured, to rest in 5 seconds. We want to know what the acceleration of a point on the edge of a hard drive is. So if we take our same V equals R omega equation, and again divide it by time, now we get something that looks more like that. V over delta T gives you acceleration. Omega over delta T gives you angular acceleration. It's going to multiply by R to go back and forth. Again, this will always be true if we're using radians. So, kind of picking out what I've got here, my radius is 0.1 meters. That's easy to see. We're going to end up with a final angular velocity of zero, because we're going to go to rest. It's going to take us five seconds. And the hard drive is initially spinning at 7,200 rotations per minute. So if you don't know what RPM means, just means rotations per minute, that would be another way of measuring angular velocity. Let's convert that to radians, though. So 7,200 rotations in one minute. Can I kind of write it like that? Multiply that by 2 pi radians per one rotation. The rotations will cancel out. 
and then multiply that by one minute per 60 seconds, and the seconds will cancel out. So now I've gone from rotations per minute to radians per second. And that would give me something like 240 pi radians per second. So now I can plug in chi. I've got alpha equals change in omega over time. The 240 pi is my final, excuse me, my initial. My final is zero, so do final minus initial over five seconds. And so we would get alpha to be 48 pi radians per second squared. And since it's slowing down, we might indicate that it was negative. What that means is that the acceleration is in the opposite direction as the initial angular velocity. So if it was rotating clockwise, then alpha would be counterclockwise. So if we convert that to linear acceleration, alpha equals r omega, excuse me, r, a equals r alpha, the r is 0.1 meter, and then our angular acceleration was 48 pi, and so just multiplying that would give us something like 4.8 pi meters per second squared. So that would change depending on the point we want to know on the hard drive. Since we were asked about the edge, we would use the furthest point out, which is where the acceleration would be the greatest. So it was likely to, if it was going to break due to the high forces involved in spinning it up, it's most likely to break at the edge rather than in the center. Last thing we're going to do, let's make a little chart comparing linear motion to rotational motion. The first thing that we did this year was define the idea of displacement, change in position. And so we redefined that for something that's rotating, just called it the angular displacement. Linear displacements are measured in meters, rotational displacements are measured in radians. To go back and forth between the two, we can use the relationship x equals r theta, or l equals r theta, however you want to write it. The next thing we defined this year was velocity, change of position over change in time. For an angular velocity, we're just going to do the change in angular displacement, delta theta over delta time. And again, we could go back and forth by multiplying or dividing by the radius of the point we're interested in. Uh, lastly, we defined acceleration, change in velocity over time. Angular acceleration is just change in angular velocity over time. And again, we can go back and forth with the equation A equals R alpha. Just multiply or divide by R. Lastly, our directions for linear motion are all of our linear directions. Up, down, left, right, east, west, north, south, in and out of the page, things like that. For a rotating object, our choices are clockwise and counterclockwise. So the directional part is a little bit simpler. We only have two choices to pick from. We just have to recognize when it's clockwise versus counterclockwise. So, do the uh, practice assignment that I gave you on rotational motion. That'll help you gain a good understanding of what a radian actually is um, before we move on to explaining how things move um, for rotating objects. So until then, have a great day.